Okay. Right. And now I'll turn the time back over. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you. So I guess uh, we will uh, officially uh, start. Um, uh, welcome to the session. I'm so happy that uh, you are here and you'd like to join us in this conversation um, about transforming uh, learning um, through the arts. Uh, my name is Ivana Hui and I'm the learning technologist of the College of Fine Arts at UNLV. Uh, which is has a, a surprising number of um, arts connected to it, from architecture, art and graphics, uh, theater, music, dance, uh, film, and um, um, entertainment, um, engineering, design. There's so many of them that I always have to make sure that I list all seven <laughs> of them. Uh, so you can probably uh, intuit that um, the move to remote um, was uh, challenging um, when it happened because most of the faculty um, had not um, done um, anything online or not much online. Um, and it was truly exhilarating to see the innovation and experimentation that happened you know, as, uh, they, uh, as the faculty adapted centuries old traditions you know, into 21st century technologies. Um, and so that's why I wanted to create these opportunities for the faculty to talk about, you know, what they what they learned and uh, facilitate discussions so that we can um, think about um, what what we can use to move forward, right? How can we transform um, online learning opportunities moving forward through those experimentation innovations um, that happened? Um, you know, on our campus and on other campuses. Um, so I always start with inviting um, participants to talk about kind of what drew them in. Um, thank you, Bridget, for speaking earlier before our official starts. Um, she's from the, um, the theater arts. Um, would anybody else um, like to speak about what, um, what brought them here, what interests them? Because that really informs what we do with these 35 minutes. I don't have a strong background in the arts except music other than enjoying theater, um, fine art, like going to museums and seeing what people can create. Um, but I'm just always intrigued on if there are ways to use things that aren't the norm. So when I saw this title, I thought that sounds like fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something that's really great about working um, with the faculty at the College of Fine Arts is that every conversation I have, I learn something new about how to become engaging in any kind of classroom. And so one of the goals of this session is for um, anybody to get introduced, anybody's interested in to get introduced to engagement techniques that art faculty are, um, are using in their, their classroom. So you're in the right space, Sulin. Thank you for sharing. Okay, if you'd like one more, um, and then I'll ask the faculty to introduce themselves. Um, okay, hello, hello everybody. So um, I guess the art element um, uh, sort of um, raised my interest. I'm an art historian presenting in half an hour. So that's one of <laughs> the very few sessions that has something to do with art and um, so, I, you know, in a sense, I, I think there is not such a big problem of teaching art history online. But when I hear my colleagues here and at SUU, like um, teaching ceramics or thinking how to teach ceramics online, then I, I, I really feel the problem. Like, I, I, then I think, well, there is not a big deal about teaching art history online. Um, but with the hands-on experience, with the need of equipment, that's a challenge that they face. So overall, it's, it's I think it's a session that I will learn more or expand my ideas about art and teaching. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so even um, in uh, courses like art history um, that are much more geared to, to learning online, there's still kind of the challenge of like how to engage students, right? We just um, heard about like distracted students. How do we engage and re-engage students um, in, the, in the classroom? Um, so, will be we can we can certainly talk about um, those aspects um, 
So thank you so much um, for sharing uh, your thoughts. Again, if you'd like to be um, on camera, um, it tends to be more engaging. That'd be wonderful. If you need to be off, no problem at all. Just feel free to unmute yourself when, you've, um, when you have um, a question. We want to make this as engaging as we possibly can. Um, so with that, um, I would like to introduce you to um, the person who co-authored um, this, this call for papers and you know, has been a great collaborator. Um, uh, his name is uh, Julian Kilker. Um, Julian, so why did you decide to um, to work on these kinds of transforming online learning through the arts um, series of presentations that we've been giving? Oh, thank you, Yvonne. Yes, um, I'm um, on the um, Faculty Technology Advisory Board at UNLV, um, where faculty get together with, with staff and uh, technologists to discuss the future of, of um, how we use these, these devices on campus. And I noticed that the discussions were not surprisingly very tech focused. We would get a new tool, we would evaluate the tool, and then it would be sort of thrown out there, maybe plugged into Canvas. And it seemed to me that this was becoming a little bit backwards. We were sort of having to put up with or work within the constraints of tools designed by other people. And as I talked with Ivana, as I looked at my own practice in my department, I'm in the School of Journalism and Media Studies, so there's a little bit of overlap in some of the topics that we look at. Um, I realized that our own areas of expertise um, could be relevant as, as professionals, as faculty, using these tools, and particularly thinking about our practices and how they could be embedded in moving these tools forward, especially now as we've become very used to them. Last year, we were all struggling to learn the basics. Now we're getting frustrated with the, the, the possibilities and we're seeing the potential and that potential is through the lenses of our various disciplines. And so that's where I started becoming very interested in it. So I've worked with Ivana on some surveys uh, that, that uh, gathered information from faculty, including faculty from the College of Fine Arts at UNLV and uh, was uh, just fascinated by the responses. And uh, I've also published something on a related topic, which I can post later if, if people are interested. So my, my goal for this panel, from my perspective, is to hear what people would like to see modified in the technologies based on your professional interests and needs, um, rather than working within the constraints that we have. How could we push those constraints even further in addition mm -hmm. to working with the, them? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yes, I, I, I hear some uh, I hear some assent, right? I mean, uh, 2020 was in many ways a pivot year. Um, moving forward, I, be I believe online education will look different than it has been for the past 40 years because um, we have all now a baseline of experiences. We've had successes and we've had frustrations. Um, next, I invite uh, Genevieve. I noticed that you're, um, that you're unmuted. Um, Genevieve um, has been an inspiration to me in thinking about transdisciplinary design and um, interactions online um, worldwide. So go ahead, Genevieve. Um, go yeah, ahead and talk um, about your interests. Uh, thanks so much, um, Yvonne, for inviting me and um, Julian, too. Um, I've had the great pleasure of um, being a little bit of a fly on the wall at UNLV. I was invited in as a research scholar in residence to um, uh, uh, share my practice and also learn from and exchange with the faculty there. Um, I am an independent artist and scholar and I've um, founded several um, interdisciplinary programs that sort of fall out of the, um, the model of a traditional higher ed um, program. And in this pivotal moment, of course, those programs got transformed um, uh, pretty exponentially, um, just like all the pivots that were going on uh, with uh, faculty that I knew across the country. And um, I adopted a lot of um, new tools and some of them including um, creating visual platforms, sort of a landing place, this idea of creating an online space and an online um, convening, um, arena that people can move in and out of, learners can sort of connect to each other. So this idea of folding in the sort of hard tools, but then also working around a certain choreography um, that, uh, uh, that now is um, part of a teacher's toolkit, really, in, in thinking in a really dimensional, almost performative way about um, not only what they're delivering, but how they're delivering it, at what pace they're delivering it, and what form they're delivering it. It's sort of calling upon us to really reinvent ourselves. And it's been um, 
uh, an amazing year. So there, I'll put in the chat box, there's two programs in particular that, I, um, that I've been working on. One is a inner hemispheric exchange. It was like an exchange program with, uh, with Chile. And we had to think of all kinds of ways. This was pre-pandemic. So all the stuff that we were doing with that cohort um, over the course of a year, it was a year long program, was we were, I don't want to say pioneering, we were, we were just sort of bumping into a lot of things and inventing things on our own before things were um, uh, the practice of the day. And now that we're sort of uh, not, I wouldn't say post-pandemic, unfortunately, mid-pandemic, um, uh, it's really interesting to be looking back at what we did then and what can be done now um, and, and comparing the collaborative um, open aspects of uh, faculty has really been amazing and moving everyone forward. So anyway, that's just a little introduction and I look forward to our conversations. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so we've moved from, like, uh, you know, uh, barriers research um, to new ways of interacting online, take advantage of the moment. Um, so with that, let me introduce um, Philip Savaris um, from the School of Architecture at UNLV, um, who has been thinking about uh, new applications, new visualization applications in his own field. Um, so Philip, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. So I am in the Landscape Architecture program. I'm an assistant professor in uh, the school. And for landscape architecture, it's extremely important that uh, students go out and visit the site that they're designing for. That's one of the more crucial things to really kind of understand how to design is to first understand place. And obviously that becomes more of a struggle in our current situation where we are very limited. And that can be either directly outside of our classroom or several hundred miles away in rural Nevada. And so now it's become the, the task to bring the site to the students in some cases. And the way I've started to approach that is the use of augmented reality and virtual reality and mixed reality to bring that space into their own kind of living environment. And what's great with that kind of experience is that not only do we get to start to understand a, an area for its spatial applications, but because these are being generated from computational models, there's also the opportunity to embed some of that uh, uh, quantitative information. So we get to learn both the qualitative and the quantitative aspects of space and natural systems, whether it has to do with wildlife habitation, uh, hydrology systems, and, either, and even uh, climatic data. And it's proven fairly effective as I've demonstrated this to both students here at UNLV as well as uh, students halfway across the country at the University of Arkansas. And we've been able to pretty effectively uh, bring those sites to our own digital uh, living spaces now. And I think what's great about it for me too is that not only do I help the students understand the space that, but for example, with students off in Arkansas, I haven't been able to visit them. So they've actually been able to bring the site uh, to me so I can even understand it a little more effectively. So there's this interesting kind of reciprocity and feedback of information uh, that can be delivered digitally through that type of platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, so as you can see, I mean, there, there are opportunities um, here um, that we can, um, that can help us um, move forward. And um, this pandemic and its needs and challenges are definitely moving that in, um, in that direction. Um, so uh, next, um, I'd like uh, Timothy Jones to speak. Timothy has, um, like all of the faculty um, that I work with uh, has, really inspired me because he was one of the like early adopters of online learning technologies as a way to make things flexible for the students. And now he is one of the leaders in HyFlex um, at um, UNLV. Um, so Timothy, go ahead. Thank you very much, Ivana. Uh, yeah, the, the irony here is that I'm not actually that tech savvy. Um, and I don't think you have to be. In, in order to use technology. And I think Julian summed it up nicely that we have so much technology that is hitting us every day. And just the fact that it's out there doesn't mean you have to use it. <laughs> and 
people jumping on top of all of this technology, it can be not only intimidating to learn, but it's intimidating for the students to try and navigate. And one of the reasons that my courses have been successful with technology is because I've really tried to meet students with the technology that they are comfortable using. That means how do they interact with their devices now? So is there a course that in the design, they they can interact with their technology how they're used to doing it? And I don't mean that my course has to be social media based, but if they interact in a certain way, then how about quizzes being along those lines? How about the way that we interact using, you know, kids were using FaceTime a long time before we got onto Zoom as an educational tool. So, mm -hmm. you know, utilize it that way. Do you really want to do that two and a half hour lecture over Zoom? Probably not. They'll all tune out after seven minutes. What is the time frame that they can take information in? How do you design your, your classroom time? One of the reasons I really loved the HyFlex teaching is that students could interact at their comfort, uh, their comfort level. And I think we can start approaching the way we design courses so that students can engage on their preferred method of learning rather than saying this class is only delivered in this way. How about you join the class through your preferred method of learning? So last summer teaching a course when most things were being done completely online, I was able to have four or five students in the classroom in very well socially distanced with masks, everything cleaned. Uh, and then there were a handful of students on Zoom. And so that opportunity to interact and students being on the screen behind me in this grid format and with my speaker, they could interact with the students in the class. The students in the class could interact with them and I could serve as a mediator between them and lead the discussion. I could also lecture. I could also share things with them if it was a musical example or an image uh, or a screen. And they all got to interact in that and and kind of uh, I think it was interesting that they could have this relational type of experience in the classroom, even if they were at home. Now, not from my perspective, but from the student's perspective, students can miss fewer classes. If I'm paying for an education, I know for me, I want to get the most out of it. And if I'm really sick and know that I shouldn't be going to class and I won't go to class, um, if I can log on and, and participate via Zoom, if I'm feeling okay, then great, I'm on the screen, I'm interacting. If not, at least I can mute my video and um, still be part of it and still continue my learning and be engaged. And such a lot of great possibilities. Uh, masterclass wise, if I'm as a musician, if I'm demonstrating something that in a class of 25, I couldn't get all of them up close to see what I'm doing with my fingers, I can do that online and show exactly <laughs> what I want them to experience, whether they're in the classroom or at home. And again, I can bring them into an experience that I couldn't do in the traditional classroom. So that's what I find to be exciting. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so um, now we can do one of a number of different things. Um, one, we could do a, like a traditional like panel um, discussion and have you ask questions of the panelists. That's one way that we can do this. Or uh, perhaps would you be interested in going into um, a breakout room with um, one of the panelists um, and just a talk in a group of about four or five um, people about the things that um, that interest you. Um, for this one, it would be um, a random interdisciplinary pairing mm -hmm. where um, you can have um, interesting and colliding conversations about your interests in this, um, this area. There's certain commonalities in uh, what the panelists are talking about. One of them has to do with um, interactions and engagement using technologies. Um, each of them um, has uh, faced barriers and so can talk about, can facilitate discussions about barriers and how to overcome them. So which way would you like to go? Do you want to um, ask questions of the panelists in this um, larger, um, in this larger group? Or would you prefer to have smaller discussions in breakout rooms?
Yvonne, I was just going to mention, um, since I wasn't so specific in my overall um, uh, talk, either way, whether it's panel or um, smaller groups, I think um, one of the, the, the sort of case studies that I brought along with me to share really talk about um, this idea of visual collaboration using tools like Mural, um, design thinking sessions, things that happen around co-collaboration um, in a virtual space. So, so just so people know that that, you know, is more specifically what um, what I could speak to. Okay, great. Thank you so much um, for for the additional information. That was that was wonderful. Um, so um, I am seeing that you would like to do the large groups, um, which I can completely understand. Right? It's always a um, a pro and con mm -hmm. for each way we can we can go, uh, but. I can promise you each of the, the panelists is so fascinating that I can totally understand that you want to, to hear from them. Um, so please feel free to ask questions. Um, you can unmute yourself, you can raise your hand, um, or you can ask in the chat, um, whatever you prefer. We're small enough that we can probably unmute ourselves. There was a couple of things that came up early in those discussions, both Bridget and Joanna brought up things about total online learning and, you know, maybe what we could do in the classroom, the art history idea, you know, I just thought immediately, like you can, you can take the students into the classroom or into the gallery. Um, and I know that you can't go to a public gallery maybe as easily, but you could certainly take them into your studio or your campus gallery, and you could do a very unique walk through the gallery or walk through a piece of art that uh, they wouldn't get uh, in a large group, even if you toured them through. Um, so make it very personal. I thought that would, would be fun. And, mm -hmm. you know, for me, sometimes being in the classroom, even if there are no students in there, because I deal with a lot of instruments, my area is percussion, I can utilize those instruments and those tools in the room because I'm in there, even if it's just me and they're online and they can, ask, could we see the timpani again? I really didn't know they could do that. Could you show us? And so we start to get some more real world questions um, that aren't just straight out of the textbook. So those yeah. things struck me from those early questions. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, do you have questions uh, for the panelists? And I can always come up with um, with questions. I'm just, Absolutely, so, Anne. Um, I'm just curious how um, to introduce the arts in my teaching more, because I am currently not much. And I feel like they're very important to help people learn. So I was hoping for some more um, and I'm getting some uh, ideas and suggestions as to how to incorporate more of those different types of learning into my courses. Um, I, I think I could speak to that. You know, um, I'm sure a lot of you um, have um, uh, been tracking some of the practices that I'm part of a community called uh, the Microsoft Innovative Educators, um, uh, Innovative Educators. It's like a, it's a global community of educators that are using technology. It's a free community to be a part of. And there's a lot of um, resources, tools, um, incredible um, network of, of educators around the world that uh, of all disciplines using technology. And one of the, um, uh, really amazing things that is uh, part of that community is this idea of um, uh, virtual classrooms, you know, visiting. So literally taking your class to Italy or to somebody who's doing scientific illustration in Chile or, you know, this idea of, of um, really opening up uh, the classroom and the experiences that they can not only view, but sort of participate in and be a part of you know, visiting a, a muralist who's working on a public art project, you know, this idea of going a little bit further than you would even in, in the regular classroom setting that gives them these tangible experiences of what art making could be or, you know, and it could be across disciplines too. Um, but I think that's one really interesting um, area. That's the one thing where location almost doesn't make a difference anymore. So on the one hand, you can't go anywhere. And on the other hand, you can go everywhere. 
Good. And I think Philip, uh, Phil, I mean, you're also working on um, on using technology in order um, to answer those kinds of questions. Yeah, so there's a lot of questions that we are trying to ask. And I think with technologies, you really learn a lot of a lot of new questions, right? It seems like I'm always asking or finding out new questions to ask versus answering a lot of those questions, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's just the advancement of technology, always kind of outpacing our own rigor and efforts, which can be certainly frustrating. And so I always try to think about what's what really is the outcome of that learning objective? Is it about keeping the students engaged and using? Is it about understanding the significance of the content we're learning? Again, I'll go back to my own uh, experiences and projects. And that's uh, one of the things that we're always kind of, at least as the instructor, I'm asking my students with the technology is that, um, is the information or is the, is the content um, digestible and comprehensible? And then, so just the ease of access to uh, what we're presenting to them. So when it comes to the site content, do they actually understand what they're looking mm -hmm. at? And then the other part is the significance. Do so they really not only uh, understand the content, but do they also understand the value of what they're learning too. And so I usually use those two kind of main points when using technology, because I think those are very much uh, translatable principles for whatever the technology is that you're using is, can they, can they uh, digest it? And do they actually understand the significance of it? Because it's a difference between memorizing something and actually comprehending something. Mm -hmm. So how can we use these technologies in order to get to that um, higher, higher level thinking, um, those, um, um, you know, those, uh, the, the impacts and significance of, um, of different things. So Becky Cash um, has a question for Genevieve. I was wondering if you have any suggestions for good websites to teach about and view public art. I use video. Um, you know, <laughs> What I think that is so um, magical about public art is that it is the regional expression of a community, right? If, if you're a, a public artist, you're, you're not just working in your studio, you're brought into a conversation with whether it's public leaders or a city that wants to you know, install a build, something on a building um, and you're tasked with um, uh, expressing more than just your view or your opinion. You're really um, ch charged to um, connect with the community. So in, with that in mind, I would actually, rather than go to one place to find out what is public art, I'd go to places and investigate the public art that happens in those places, like the um, huge revival around murals right now. I mean, you know, where we live, uh, we're in Capitol Hill. I mean, I don't live in Capitol Hill, but we're in Seattle. And of course, with the whole Black Lives Matter within, within a very short amount of time, a whole section of the city was covered with uh, brand new like public art expressions. So um, the idea of uh, anchoring place to and having the students actually investigate that, you know, let, let's say you handed out uh, a hat with, with, you know, 25 cities in it, and each of the students picked a city, and they do the sort of research and come back with uh, what is happening in the in the realm of public art in those places. I think that might be a, a fresher approach, because you're going to, if they're doing the research, you're likely going to um, uncover things that are happening um, more recently and, and relevant. And there's also the historical approach too, but I think there's something about this moment that we're in where public art is really sort of a critical um, uh, channel because so much is going on right now that it would be interesting to be in the present moment with that topic. Thank you. So something that I'm hearing, uh, like a theme that I'm hearing from uh, the questions um, that you're asking 
is really about well getting new suggestions for engagements you know from mm -hmm. the arts perspectives okay. so i'm wondering is it we have uh we have an um an artist um transdisciplinary designer we have um, an, an architect who is working with AR. We have a musician and we have a photographer and, and researcher. So we have quite like a few different you know, disciplines and their perspectives. I'm wondering if you can talk about like the barriers that you've experienced moving online and how you are transcending those barriers um, with your art from your perspective or with the technology? Um, so maybe uh, Julian, would you like to start since you're the, the person who did the barriers research? Sure, yeah, yeah, I can, I can talk about the barriers a bit. One of the, um, so when we started, um, Surveying faculty in in, in uh, fine arts college of fine arts, um, people were talking about the the intense challenge as faculty members of keeping up not only with the change of the technologies but also of resources, new resources that were necessary to work with these technologies. And so, Becky, your question about uh, public art and and uh, Genevieve's answer, I was thinking immediately because I'm I'm in a, a journalism program, although I work with visual arts and media technologies. I was immediately thinking, immediately thinking of global photojournalism and mm. being able to. So I, I had to go out and find sources. And one of the big moves recently, which is related to COVID, but not directly, is a lot of the public media outlets are no longer accessible to us um, on college campuses because they're now paywalled because journalism is having right. difficulty paying its own way. So all of a sudden, a lot of the resources for at least contemporary um, uh, coverage in, in the topics that I teach were no longer available. Uh, New York Times blocks uh, easy access now, Washington Post, LA Times, all the other sort of mainstream publications. Um, the Atlantic has wonderful photojournalism, global, uh, activists, Black Lives Matter, COVID, public mm -hmm. art, amazing, amazing, large format photography, um, really wonderful, harder to access now. So I'm what I'm struggling with is helping students uh, access this, but also value it so it can be supported uh, okay. in the future. Um, and this goes back to the idea of if something is worth it, then what is it worth to us and how do we contribute towards it? Um, so that's been my challenge in, in teaching is um, not only thinking about the actual sort of content resources, but also thinking about what technological resources that I want to, that I think are important enough to teach with, but also introduce the students to. It's like a mm -hmm. long-term relationship. You know, what is it worth spending the time doing? Which ones am I vouching for to the students? If they're not already students, or like, like Tim was saying, uh, tools are already familiar with. What are these mm -hmm. tools? So um, that's been a real challenge. Um, and, and also an interesting opportunity to reinvent the classes, mm -hmm. uh, which I've really enjoyed. Um, so Tim, like, like, like you said, and, and Phil as, all, as well, this idea of, of taking advantage of the constraints and then doing something creative with it. Mm -hmm. Really, really interesting. What I'm curious about is how will we integrate those new ways of teaching and those new formats down the road after for, uh, COVID becomes less critical? Can they yeah. add value to our future classes in a non-COVID era? That's what I'm particularly curious about. Well, and I think to your point, this idea of uh, the, the boldness that uh, this predicament that we're in <laughs> is um, is encouraging us to be to rather than just like what's the technology I can use to deliver what I need to deliver like almost roll that whole thing up toss it out <laughs> and start fresh right I'm um, I I brought a example this isn't necessarily teaching in the higher ed realm but um, if I can share my screen I'm not sure if I oh yeah I can. Uh, there was a mural project of all things on the tales of this last conversation, a public mural project that was involved with um, four schools in Chile. They were um, coastal communities that, um, uh, and it was supposed to be um, sort of this intersection of art and science working with um, the marine biologists and the scientists and, um, and the artists, um, award-winning muralists in, in four different fishing villages around Chile. 
and these were going to be murals in the town. Um, then COVID hit. So um, uh, I had already been working with this team on the idea of doing sort of a virtual portal into what these murals could be. So they couldn't be painted anymore. They couldn't be painted in real time um, because um, you know nobody could gather together to do it. But the idea that um, we could do something in a virtual way, co-create things, and we're you know a hemisphere away from each other. The team in Chile, I had a team here that worked in, in a virtual um, way. I'm going to show you the other um, the fly-throughs that we ended up creating, um, where um, let's see these. I'm not sure if you can see. Um, but we worked with um, a VR artist here and created um, essentially these VR experiences that um, are deployed from the image that the muralist, the traditional muralist did in um, Chile. So instead of it being a mural project, it ended up being, um, we did printed postcards that went to all the schools and um, we, we just sort of worked our way around a whole different project, imagining it in a completely different way because we couldn't be there to do what we had set out to do. Um, again, it's, it's, I don't know if it's the best example, but um, I guess my point being um, this, this boldness in thinking about how you, how, what you ignite in the way of collaboration, um, what you ignite in the way of what you would ask your students to do or think about, um, and this almost co-creation because it, 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 in this moment as educators, we're learning also. So to be very transparent about it and just sort of jump in and not, and not be the person that knows everything about how things are gonna get rolled out, but to be very experimental um, with what can happen and also forgiving because this isn't gonna last forever and what you learn in this juicy moment is gonna sort of inform how bold and daring you are when things settle down. If I could j jump on that just really quickly, Genevieve, I, excellent advice. And, and I would say that this boldness, what fascinates me is that we're, we're encountering this around the world simultaneously, pretty much. So mm -hmm. I'm seeing colleagues in Europe uh, doing really amazing work. And now it's easier to, those barriers have sort of dropped and I can see the tools that they're creating, the sites they're curating, and uh, the barriers are down. They're much more accessible than they might be in normal times. Mm -hmm. So this is like a, a really golden moment to collaborate if we can overcome the stresses, the daily stresses of life now and, and just struggling with the tools. So mm -hmm. some really interesting opportunities, creative opportunities as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. I feel like after 35 minutes, uh, we are just getting started mm -hmm. you know, with the, the meat of the conversation. Um, it's always such a pleasure you know, working with this faculty. Um, and it's such a, it's been such a pleasure um, being at this conference. Um, I sent something in the, in the chat. It's a conversation about envisioning a post-pandemic future for arts and media higher education. Um, so if you'd like to continue the conversation, uh, please, um, please feel free to, to register and add your thoughts um, about using um, tools and the barriers you are facing and how to overcome them. Well, that so, was quick. I didn't realize that, it was so quick. I'm going to save my chat. <laughs> yes, yes, it's, um, yes. I guess uh, leave them wanting more. That, that's certainly I want more from uh, from our panelists. So um, thank you so much, um, Phil and Tim. If you would like to just add uh, one more word of wisdom um, for all of us. Sure. Um, I would just say that I've got elementary school kids and elementary, middle school and high school kids just took on a huge surge of use of technology. And despite challenges and things, they took it all on. And so what is our next generation of university and college students going to expect when they come into the, those learning experiences? So I know it's a question, but it's something that we all have to think about. Thanks so much. Um, and Phil? Yeah, I, I think the one of the things that we're encountering with this uh, remote learning situation is just this technology exhaustion where it seems like everything is a little bit overwhelming and I think it's key to stick with what works for you and not feel like you have to chase every new 
device or technology that comes out. I, it's all about the effectiveness and the delivery of, um, of content. So I, I'd say um, stick with uh, those tools that work best for you and um, don't get overwhelmed. Right. And I think that's exactly what you have done. Right. You, you chose uh, AR and now you're deeply delving into it. Um, thank you so much. So the, the resources and links um, from the uh, panel participants um, will be shared in the T4L um, conference learning app. Um, so go ahead and um, go back and um, you can find out more about the panelists and their work and please add your own um, thoughts and uh, resources. Thank so you so that, much. Yeah, thank yeah. you. So Thanks much. so much, Yvonne, for convening this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank and you, Julian, everybody. too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm.